looking around the Zero RB universe and what it means for the rest of the fantasy football season. Who are the players at the running back position that you need to keep an eye out for? Obviously, some of them will be the, the big names that are performing, but we've seen this past week in NFL Week 6, Sean Tucker's breakout game for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Obviously, we have different moving parts in that. We have Bucky Irvin, who also was very good in that game. We also have Rashad White to come back into the, the picture here. So some of the situations you need to, to keep an eye on top of. But Sean Siegel each week in the Zero RB universe up on rotaviz.com. I will link it in today's show notes. Goes through all the players that you need to know, that you need to look out for. And that's what we're going to go through today. Highlight some of the names and talk through that. So Sean, NFL week seven. It's hard to believe we're already at that point of the season. We are firing through. You know, some of the leagues have shorter front ends of the season depending on how the playoffs are structured and so on in them so we'll begin into week 12 13 we're already in towards the playoffs but we are approaching the halfway point of most of the the standard formats as well so a lot of the picture has been painted but there's a lot more to come in these coming weeks we touched on i believe it was on the first recap show we did this week about the trey mcbride numbers and how his season turned out from this point forward last year there is going to be i mentioned to sean about picking up sean tucker in one of my dynasty leagues this week and you know i was saying about there mightn't be many more big hits to try and buy on the waiver wire over the the rest of the season he highlighted that there was a couple this week so maybe i'm jumping in too early and we might see a few more sneak through here as we move forward because there's a lot of these running backs that haven't really been on the field until the last couple of weeks the likes of tyron tracy tyron tracy we've seen uh, vidal get in the end zone for the chargers this past week uh kendry muller remember him uh, you know <laughs> we'll see if he can get in there with the saints before the end of the season as well he's been on injured reserve and we get the likes of nick chubb coming back we get jonathan brooks ready to make his nfl debut so so much will change even at that single position for the running back so sean week seven we're ready for it. How are you feeling as we approach another week of the, the NFL? Good. As we mentioned, week six, one of the best, not just this year, but in the last decade for our portfolios in part because, and I did go ahead last night for the first time in 2024, actually work through all of my redraft teams and When you do sort of a physical process of typing everyone out, thinking through where you are, record points, free agent budget remaining, where you are at each positional group, QB, running back, wide receiver, tight end, it gives you a stronger feel for what you need, even if you understand your overall player exposures. And even if obviously you have a good sense of where those teams were going in, one of the things that jumped out uh, that I knew, but was certainly very, very encouraging, is that especially at the main event level, unfortunately, in the 350 level, uh, because we continued to get good draft slots and because of the way those drafts were going, on that side of it, I have a little bit too much Dalton Kincaid. And that has been sort of weighing down what are otherwise pretty exciting teams. On the main event side, almost every team includes two out of the three of Trey McBride, George Kittle, and Brock Bowers. And right now, that looks like what you're going to need. Colm, I was working through our team, and our team did lose last week. It was one of my only teams that lost. <laughs> we haven't had the best luck with it. Uh, we needed Jameer Gibbs to not have a down week on the Half up, half down. Last week was an all-play week in FFPC. We have Nico Collins. We're waiting for him to come back. We have Jalen Waddell. We're waiting for uh, Tua to come back. The team is not in great shape, but you're still in this range where, if you kind of look at the teams in general, teams that are in that sort of 830 scoring level are fine. They're, they often have the fourth playoff spot if they don't they're a handful of points away teams that are in the 790 range which is where you and i are they're back they're usually toward the 40th percentile maybe sometimes a little bit lower than that but you think about 840 790 or 830 790 that's just one decent week and we have six weeks remaining 
And what you and I are hoping to do is get across this gap to where we have Collins, to where we hopefully have Waddle as not just someone who's out there, but someone who's actually fantasy viable. And we have a lot of other good players on the team. We have both McBride and Bowers. We're hoping that Xavier Worthy can take a step, obviously, to have those other receivers not really in the mix and then Worthy on the bye. That made it a little bit trickier on the all play. We have Jordan Addison. We've got Chase Brown, who looks like he's ready to go. We have CJ Stroud. We added Drake May to give ourselves a little more upside at the QB2 spot. Sort of as we're recording this, we are waiting to see what maybe the health situation is there with May. But it sounds like it's mostly precautionary, some of the checks that they're doing. I still love our team. I love our draft. We are in the mix, but really almost everybody is still in the mix. I I encourage everyone who's participating, who's fired up at this point, to really push and to get across that gap in the next month. Position yourself to have a super team when we hit the fantasy playoffs. Managing free agency is going to be a big part of that. Column, you mentioned that you know we may not have too many more big hits. But we have some out of nowhere performances from Sean Tucker. One of the things you know that I mentioned in the zero RB write up was we see different players in different ways, right? You can look at someone like a Saquon Barkley who hasn't played that well the last couple of years, but his name is Saquon Barkley. He is big. He's explosive. He does what he does in week one, and people are like, "This is the one hundred one." <laughs> well, I mean, that's possibly true. It's very possibly true, but it's certainly a strong reaction to someone who actually has put up a track record recently that's not overly strong. Sean Tucker had a game of that caliber in week six. And yet, because he is very clearly not Saquon Barkley and never has been, it's looked at in a different way. And one of the things that kept his price down in free agency was that even as people are finalizing their bids yesterday, you have a report from Tampa beat writer saying Rashad White is still the number one. And I think for most people, they're like, I mean, that team kind of has to say that. But having that come out, it's something where the player who had one of the five best performances of a running back all season, because that's what that was, is still going to be the RB3 on his team? Possible. It did make it to the level where I was bidding somewhere between say 150 and there may have been a team or two. I went to like 355, but mostly it was like 150 to, to 305 on the bids was able to get Tucker in 15 out of 18 redraft leagues. That's about where I would have wanted that to be any higher. And you're probably throwing money away just knowing like <laughs> what higher percentage you got of him. We've talked about bidding tactics on a previous show. Anything lower, and you probably didn't create enough exposure to a guy who could be the difference maker as we go on. The flip side of it, or the other interesting thing there, as we think to the future and who might be available, one of the interesting things that had happened in a couple of leagues that I am in, and certainly I know that this was broadly true, that Ray Davis was probably cut going into this week in about 5% of FFPC leagues, somewhere in that range. If you had the full budget remaining, then you could add him. So maybe the best team that I currently have is a main event with Ben Gretsch that we did for Stealing Bananas. That team had like 980 left, and we were able to bid in the 780 range, cover almost everyone, also put pressure on the people we didn't cover that they would have had to spend basically their entire budget in order to go over us and not have their flexibility remaining. We got Davis. We still have 207 left. And so there are a lot of different bids that we can make on that. One thing I would encourage people to think about, and you know, certainly as you know, I look across my portfolio and what I have remaining in a lot of leagues, I have spent into that, say, 200 to 600 range in most leagues i have one 
I have two teams that are below 100 at this point, and I needed to push on those, or there was a great opportunity. One of them is one where I needed to push. The other one is one where my team was absolutely loaded everywhere, and there probably weren't going to be a lot of pickups across the year, and Josh Downs had been cut. Now, this was obviously several weeks ago, about a month ago now. But even at that point, I'm looking at my roster, and I'm thinking – there aren't holes. You can always have a lot of injuries, but even with that, I wouldn't cut any of these players. I'm probably only going to make a few moves all season. And so I spent almost everything to make sure I got downs. I don't know if I need to do that. I didn't have a chance to go back and look at what the outcome was there. I don't care. I wanted downs. <laughs> Whatever else happened, now that team looks like a team that could win the whole thing. So again, every league is a little bit different and we want to make sure that we have a strategy that works, but within that we want our tactics to be fluid and to address what's happening on every individual team basis. Colin, did you have any chances to bid for Ray Davis? Where are you seeing him as it contrasts with Sean Tugger? Because the most obvious thing there is that even though Davis might not be better He was added to the team more recently. He's a rookie this season. And they have Ty Johnson there, but this does look like a two-person committee going forward as opposed to a three-person committee. And in each instance, there are sort of different incentives at play. There are different possibilities that a player could simply take the number one spot. Even with how well he played, it seems somewhat unlikely to me that Tucker takes over for... Bucky Irving since he was just drafted even though James Cook has a higher profile than Bucky Irving my gut sense of it based on when the different players were selected and what the incentives are for the organizations and what they're trying to accomplish I think that Ray Davis has an easier path to simply be the starter going forward in Buffalo not actually this week right but once the injury clears up once they're looking at both guys together that Davis is the guy there with the Buffalo Bills. What did you think of his performance? Where are you with these guys? And then if there were any other big bids that you had in week six. I didn't have an opportunity to get Davis in in any leagues, any of the ones that I was in. He was currently rostered. So I didn't have the opportunity. I would like to have that, as some listeners will know, some of the leagues that I'm in. I'm including those guillotine leagues, Sean. I'm I'm in need of running backs. So I... I would have appreciated the chance to add him on. In terms of the rest of the season, I think that it's it's important to react quickly to these things as to how it happens. But I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that if I was a James Cook manager, I would still, like at that point, I would have been very happy with how things were looking for the rest of the season. Obviously, he misses this past Monday night's game. And it, sometimes it can just be like a, a sliding doors moment where things change. But the same with the Buccaneers, where I think sometimes nfl teams and nfl coaches are a little bit reluctant to move based on somebody who wasn't at the a certain point of their depth charter and their plans specifically at the point where they have that game i think they tend to lean back to what they wanted prior to that so i think like with the the buccaneers i think we're still going to see rashad white get his opportunities and i think we're going to be frustrated probably with how he may eat more into what we're going to see from bucky Irving in these next couple of weeks than into Rashad White's work I think the same with the Ray Davis situation I think that James Cook will continue to lead that backfield I think that there's a chance as the season goes on it'll split up a bit more but you know it could be something that we're talking about for a few weeks but I've been very impressed Sean so far this season with the James Cook side of his play so I'm more skeptical on Ray Davis taking over that whole backfield than I would be with either of the the Buccaneers moving into that position it sounds like you're on the opposite side where you you think that he's going to work in more than the Buccaneers guys but we've been talking about the the kind of efficiency issues with Rashad White for the last season and a half and he has through his receiving work overcome that in the mid to late part of last season specifically I think that James Cook is doing enough for the Buffalo Bills that they're going to keep him involved. And when it is just a two backfield, two people in the backfield like a Davis and a Cook, I think that can work both for the offense and for the players for fantasy, but it just will limit some of the upside for them. Um, 
a little bit concerned as to how the backfield in, in Tampa Bay is going to work out with the three of those guys in there. But I, I do think, although Tucker had the, the breakout performance last week, I think the, the depth chart when we get to week seven, if White is out there, is going to be shuffled in the same order with, with White, then Irvin, then Tucker. Yeah, I, one of the things Ben and I were talking about just sort of between us was that the Sean Tucker thing could actually just be a disaster where he ends up carving. They could all into, siphon from each other. Yeah, if he mostly carves out some work that would have otherwise gone to Bucky Irving, then it's going to be a problem. I guess at some point, one of the things that we know is that decision-making from an NFL coaching staff can be very stubborn in the face of new information yeah. and it can be very inefficient that is something that is a human condition not necessarily an nfl coaching staff condition in our personal lives we all know of things that we have done in the past or certainly people we interact with friends family co-workers maybe acquaintances that you don't care for people who are stubborn and continue to make the same mistakes or continue to do something that probably is counterproductive for longer than you would like to see before you make a change. I guess to me, the contrast between Irving and Tucker and white is so vast that. And, you know, and we now have gone through the stretch again where white has had a good chunk of time to prove that he doesn't do anything for you. So we'll see. I, I certainly, <laughs> I'm scared. I'm also a bit optimistic because again, I just a team that wants to win at this point, it just doesn't make any sense to throw Rashad White out there. And I would include as a receiver. Colin, you mentioned Kendra Miller. He's a guy similar to these other players that I have on 15 of the 28 redraft teams. That may seem high or crazy considering how little he has done. But you think about what we got from Kamani Vidal last week. You think about what happened with Ray Davis where people were, again, not in a huge number of leagues, but where his production to this point had been cuttable for at least some managers. And then you end up being an 800 bid type of guy. You think about where we were a couple weeks ago with Tyrone Tracy, you think about where we are coming out of the bye with Blake Corum. More of these guys are going to do something, and you want to inexpensively set up for that so that when you do then need to make an expensive move, you can afford it, as opposed to consistently doing things that are not very cost effective. Colin, we now have the possibility that. Miller will be the next in this line of breakout players. He potentially has a bit more opportunity with Chris Olave and Rashid Shahid out. Now, the offense will not be as functional. It won't be as dynamic. You probably don't get as many red zone touches. But Alvin Kamara is going to have all the work he can handle, including a lot of receiving touches and maybe some touches split out wide. We could get these guys on the field at the same time. You're going to be in all likelihood, very run heavy as the team tries to manage the game for Spencer Rattler while deploying players like Bob means. I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic that some of these things can work than it might seem. I mean, the median outcome here is going to be just pretty bad for the Saints. They have too many young players and too many injured players to be able to still accomplish their goals on offense. And by that, I mean, getting first downs, executing the plays that are called. Those things are going to be difficult. But I think that you're going to have a lot of run plays. And Kendra Miller is a guy who we still don't really know what he is. And it's possible that all of the hype is for nothing. But it's actually still very possible that a healthy version of him becomes a star now not necessarily this week but over the rest of the season what we're hoping for from him is something similar to what tyrone tracy is doing for the giants i think because you have the sean tucker game and the ray davis game and because the giants didn't score a lot of points 
it's easy to overlook what he did. Colin, this is the second big game from Tracy. I have him on 11 of 28 teams. That has been a big reason that week six went so well. I tend to focus on those three big tight ends because they're so important. But the trio of Tracy, Irving, and then getting that late touchdown from Chase Brown, all of those little pieces were crucial for the week six success as well. Yeah, Tracy looked uh, fantastic, particularly in the receiving game. We talked about that a bit on the the Monday edition, I believe it was Sean this week. But seeing you know Chase Brown back out there start to work his way, you know, into a larger chunk of the role, I think that might be the backfield that we we go and look at next. But you know, in the article, Sean, you talk a little bit about Kenneth Walker this week. Walker, we've talked about you know for a long time in glowing terms on the show, but it feels like if you you know you talked about Saquon Barkley earlier as you know one hundred and one he's obviously playing for the seahawks rather than the eagles but i i think if you're looking at running backs rest of the season kenneth walker really has to be right at the the top of that list but when we go down then and look at the Bengals, because we've talked and talked and talked about them over the off season we've talked about them a couple of times in the season but it really feels like over the last couple of weeks brown looks to be healthier moss looks to be having some more efficiency struggles had a fumble this past week and now it looks to be that we're in a situation where brown is going to start to to lead this backfield which for people who drafted him obviously is going to be very valuable for anyone who's added him to the the roster mid trades during the season i think it's going to be the transition happening now does it feel to you like we're about to see him really break out in this offense over the next couple of weeks and before i let you answer that the one thing i did want to mention when you talked about the saints we are recording this prior to thursday night football so you know Kendry Miller could be involved in that potentially or anything could happen in that game but we are recording it before in case you know things have changed in the the meantime Sean the Cincinnati Bengals is it a case that Brown is just ready to take over this backfield fully now I guess I don't think that that is probably going to be the case I think what you're looking for is a committee that's tilted in his favor as opposed to tilted against him it's a committee where even Can we though, get him to seventy percent? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. We're just not seeing that many backfields where you have a viable number two or a number one with I don't want to even say weaknesses exactly, but maybe stylistic weaknesses that you're gonna see that from. You also have a situation where they're schedule between now and the beginning of the fantasy playoffs so week seven through week 14 is neutral you like to see that the main thing that you're hoping to not get here is just a bad schedule right so i think that brown is going to be the guy slightly more often than not around the goal line that part will be very important he probably won't run as many routes or what I should say is he probably isn't going to be in on as many third downs. But in week six, they ran the same number of routes. Brown is a guy who you can design passing plays for. You're trying to get him in space. The touchdown at the end of week six is a little bit unique because the defense is selling out all their guys to stop. If you get through the first level, there's not going to be anybody there. But it's another reminder of his ability to create long scores a couple more of those at some point this season, potentially even a 50 plus yard score, very much in the cards. That in and of itself is a start worthy play. You get a 50 yard touchdown. So, working through that, I think we have to be very encouraged. The situation with Tracy could be even better. Now, he's done this with Devin Singletary out. Singletary had been okay. They also are having some offensive line issues that could make this entire offense, which is already one that's controversial. I think that you watch what Daniel Jones has done moving the ball, and that part is exciting. You watch how competitive they have been, even with Malik Neighbors out. That part is exciting. You do now have a situation where Neighbors and Robinson and Slayton probably complement each other very well. And then Theo Johnson gives you a little bit of that uh, ascending tight end and athletic tight end component too. If you then throw a back like Tyron Tracy 
in the mix, your offense can be pretty decent. I think if you go back to Devin Singletary, it probably hurts you. This is one, again, where the hope that you have is maybe for a 60-40 in his favor. But the way that I wrote this up, and it's not just that the EP numbers were there for him in this one. He got pretty close to that EP double-double that we like to talk about. But he ran 25 routes. He caught all six of his targets for 57 yards. He broke two tackles as a receiver. He could be converted three first downs in that capacity. Tracy, and I believe that Kevin wrote this up during the preseason, but Tracy looks like David Johnson in 2015, where he, and it is basically because of injury that some of these things are unlocked down the stretch and that David Johnson has the massive fantasy playoffs heading into 2016, where he has one of the all-time epic running back seasons. But this looks like a David Johnson situation. Now, Tyrone Tracy doesn't come in with the huge banked performance that David Johnson had had as a collegiate player. But stylistically, there are a lot of similarities. What they do well, I mean, Tracy brings those things to the table. And if Tyrone Tracy can beat David Johnson from this point, all of the teams you have with him are going to be very, very good. Yeah, it was super exciting. And we'll see what uh, Singletary's health status and that. When we're looking at the picture, you know, in Cincinnati, and I did mention in Buffalo, there is like current, there's three names there, but there's really two guys that are having good performances. I think that Eric Gray and the time that he has been in the offense over the last couple of weeks has like been completely bypassed in this situation. And I, I do feel like Singletary has been playing well, but the upside of the rookie coming in there to just add that extra to punch to it, it's going to be interesting to see how the Giants use that moving forward just as you mentioned the offense there's a lot of parts moving we've missed out on well like neighbors the last two weeks obviously the start to the season that he was off to so i think the giants offense is gonna be fun for fantasy here the rest of the way for wendell robinson managers you know they'll be aware that there's not a huge amount of yards per reception but there's a lot of receptions and a lot of targets uh, to benefit you from his perspective as well so it's been a, a, an interesting start to the season for them and an offense that we felt would be um undervalued at this particular point sean you mentioned vidal he obviously has the flash play to get into the the end zone with the receiving touchdown shows his receiving skills on that particular situation dobbins also while not been very efficient in this game gets in the end zone has almost 100 rushing yards and you know post the bye week he had kind of faded a little bit heading into the bye week but you know, coming off the injury, I think everything considered, this has to have to be a very positive start. So if you're a, a Dobbins manager, which we are in some situations, you're going to be saying he has started off very positively, you know, in terms of he stayed healthy, he's got in the end zone, he's getting the work, leading the backfield. But then Vidal is now active. If you're a Vidal manager, you'll be saying, this is what we waited for. He's got his opportunity. He's going to shine now. Both sides could potentially be correct in terms of what we've talked about with these other rosters, where it could be, know work for the two of those guys and it's split between them but how do you see that developing now because i know sean siegel is a big jk dobbins guy but i know there's also interest uh and and vidal coming in here as a rookie yeah this was a fantastic backfield to play i think between the two of them i ended up with about 45 percent in best ball i know that lots was of too cost managers. effective to add them in you know yeah and a lot of managers are obviously trying to be very spread with their portfolios i understand that and yet there are certain points in drafts where the price as you just mentioned and then you have a fairly strong belief in some type of a binary outcome or even a complimentary outcome now very few of the teams maybe zero have both guys so it is something where you're betting in different directions on different teams i think these two guys at this point can probably succeed together they both have the type of running style that will work in an offense that is not going to provide some advantages in that there's not going to be a lot <laughs> of disguise or there's not going to be a lot of question about what the charters want to do right they're going to try and run on you they're going to try and win through their defense 
essentially exactly like their game plan and their success against the Denver Broncos. Whether or not that works and creates a large enough pie is the question, but I think that when you have Justin Herbert, that additional piece, because so many of these teams that want to be extremely run heavy don't have any concept for how that could really work, and it doesn't mesh with who their quarterback is or what the passing game is. One of the things that is really weird, at least as we record, is this kind of conversation about who should be the starting quarterback with the Steelers. The thing that they are doing that is bizarre if you believe the quarterback is related to any of this is that the Steelers run almost every play and they run very ineffectively and that makes it difficult on their running backs and it makes it difficult on their quarterback so if you want your running backs to be more efficient and you want your quarterback to be able to create plays you have to call the game in a completely different way right you can't really put it on Justin Fields you can't really put it on Najee Harris and Jalen Warren you have to put it on the coaching staff we get a very different dynamic here with the Chargers and one that I think can be successful. Now, we do want to consider that while some of the teams that we've discussed, the Buccaneers have one of the best remaining schedules for running backs. The New York Giants have one of the best remaining schedules for running backs. The Chargers rank 31st. Now, they're scheduled between now and week 12, which will be very important for a lot of teams as they try and get there is okay and so i think that during that stretch you are likely to see both guys continue to take strides you're going to see this as an efficient rushing offense one of the things with jk dobbins is that you mentioned a lack of efficiency and yet he evaded six tackles to be able to get to his 96 rushing yards to get to his touchdown he needed to defeat an elite denver broncos defense that knows they're going to run in order to accomplish what he did accomplish, he evaded six tackles. Only Najee Harris and Bucky Irving had more. I am pretty excited about what he's doing because despite the lack of true long speed right now, Dobbins is one of the best backs in the NFL behind the line of scrimmage, at the line, getting through the line at the first level. And so even when you're faced with difficulties, you're faced with defenders in the backfield, you're faced with arm tackles, he can beat all of those things through this elite combination of vision and then contact balance to where you, I mean, he's not a huge guy. If you do get a big defender on him, you're probably going to bring him down. That's a lot easier said than done. And then when he gets to the second level, he can turn a five-yard gain into a 25-yard gain. We've seen him a couple times this season turn him into 50-yard gains. I don't know that we're going to get too many more of those. We're probably not going to get a lot of 70-yard touchdowns. But consistently through the season, turning 5-yard gains into 25-yard gains is huge for you as a fantasy manager, and especially if you are in that group of managers who is actively rooting against Kamani Vital and needs to, Dobbins to hold him off. I think that that's a very promising note for him. These two guys can both be good as receivers. I think this backfield is going to be one of the largest pie backfields, you know, at least over the next month and a half. And then we'll see what they can do to handle that really tough schedule. But even that tough finish to the season, if you have the type of team that the Chargers have, I think it's a little bit less scary. It's certainly not anywhere to the point with like the Detroit Lions. But there is not a team out there that if Detroit walks out on the field with them this week, that you're going to feel like David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs are not going to still be able to ram it down the throat. The Lions are that good. And I think that the Chargers, while not there, are a little bit more in that direction. Whereas even with a lot of these teams that are good, one of the things we saw from Brees Hall, I think Brees Hall, I think he's going to be the highest running back scorer the rest of the way. And there's a real chance that he gaps the field. He's still a guy where you really like those positive matchups. Now, for everybody, you like the positive matchups. But when you get those matchups, you're like, he's going to break multiple long runs. He possibly could have a multi-touchdown game. He might catch five passes. You're thinking 30, 40, 45 points. Those things are all potentially there. 
We're not going to get that with the Chargers, but I think that they can more or less do it to a viable level on anybody. Yeah, and it's it's really awesome just on the J.K. Dobbins side again to see him looking healthy, uh, being out there, being able to play after what he's gone through the last couple of seasons. And I, I know he's somebody we've talked about his kind of recovery back a couple of times here on the show. So that is cool to see. Sean, a couple of people who have you know made recoveries back. The first one I'm going to talk about here is not somebody who's name drop specifically in the piece itself but the cleveland browns have been a, a really bad situation let's just say that and try and be kind to the this season uh we all know about the quarterback play how bad it is the contract situation they have traded amari cooper away to the buffalo bills this week but jerome ford picked up an injury pierre strong is there Dante foreman is there nick chubb sean recovering from his injury expected to be in the mix this week now we're recording this on thursday so there is not a possibility that you know they hold them off uh for a further week but is that a case where and i'm asking this also as somebody who drafted way more nick chubb than i ever anticipated this offseason is that a case where he's there the offense is probably going to continue to struggle as it has been but he if healthy and can handle it is it's going to legitimately be the workhorse and uh, run that backfield again One of the things that the Browns have done is try and build everything this season around Deshaun Watson, give him the best chance to succeed. That blew up spectacularly. Yeah, (laughs) definitely (laughs) didn't work. Now they've moved Amari Cooper. They're going to be extremely run heavy, and they're going to try and pass off of that. We'll see if that helps Jerry Judy, helps David Njoku a little bit. You'd like, when you look at their situations and what the – target shares could be you'd like to think they're at least viable if you need an emergency play at either of those two positions i'm pretty excited about nick chubb now part of this is just a humility based play or a wide range of outcomes play where you certainly don't know what is going to happen and it could be that he comes back and he's just a guy and if you're just a guy you're a big bodied runner you're playing on a terrible team for a terrible offense then you know you're trey sermon and there's no value in playing trey sermon even if trey sermon is going to be the starter so there's no guarantee there for you the browns have a little bit of an interesting schedule here and then it's really sort of three discrete chunks where between now and week 11 they have three pretty soft matchups and a bye. Within that five-week stretch that includes four games, you'd love to see Chubb establish himself as the starter to look like 80% of maybe what he was pre-injury to kind of distance himself from Jerome Ford and anybody else that the Browns want to run out there. Some of that's going to depend on how injured Ford is because he has played well recently Then you go through this four-week stretch from 12 to 15 that is very difficult. You have the Steelers a couple times. You have those Broncos. You have the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm not that enthusiastic that they'll be able to run on those teams regardless of how good Chubb is. Now, if you actually got 100% Nick Chubb, then you're thinking this is one of the greatest runners ever. You can probably do that. Week 16, week 17, back to a very soft schedule you get the matchups with the Bengals, the matchup with the miami dolphins the dolphins might be a little bit different if the team is still in the mix if they get to a back they work their way back into playoff consideration they get some defensive guys healthy, all those types of things but weeks 16 and 17 you have a chance if nick chubb is on your roster for him to be in the lineup and not just there not just covering a spot and giving you some points but being a league winner for you by virtue of helping you win in the semis helping you win in the finals i think it's an interesting move to make now if you have some sort of superfluous resources and you're trying to round out that running back group so much of what we want to do from a zero rb perspective is to balance the proactive moves with being aggressive once things happen and opportunities open up right so when you have those chances to bid in a big way on a sean tucker or a ray davis you would do that 
But when you have these guys who haven't really done it yet and some of their managers are going to be concerned about them or you're looking at the depth charts, you're seeing who the next player up is going to be. Blake Watson is someone that I mention a lot with the Denver Broncos, even though I think it's a very low chance that that pays off. I mean, Sean Tucker <laughs> going into the season, you're not ever thinking that he's going to have a 200 scrimmage yard game with multiple touchdowns. That balance is how you take either a zero RB approach or some type of modified version of that and get to the point where you then have stars at every level. One of the things that has been so fun in 2024 column is that with the right approach, you could be dominant in all four position groups. And when you accomplish that type of objective or that set of objectives, it's very fun waking up on Sunday mornings. Yeah, it gets you excited. So it's also fun, Sean, waking up on Monday and Tuesday mornings when you have those, you know, high scores in your lineup. But as we get ready to close out here, is there anything else from this week's Zero RB Universe that you wanted to highlight, or have we kind of went through some of the main talking points there? Well, it was it was disappointing. I think that Antonio Gibson uh, wasn't able to show what he can do with Ramon Gray Stevenson out. It reminds us that especially for bad teams, we're going to get very inconsistent results. So in some of these games where Jacoby Brissett played extremely poorly, the Patriots were still able to generate running back points in a game where the Patriots didn't initially have the ball a bunch, but Drake May did some at least exciting things. If inconsistent things, they weren't able to do that. So those things were disconnected. You have a game here where... Travis Etienne suffers yet another injury and the Jaguars go away from Tank Bigsby. We have a game where I kind of mentioned Trey Sermon. He was one of those players I was skeptical about preseason in part because the background there is not of a breakout guy. That doesn't mean that a player won't do it. And if you have an offense like the Kansas City Chiefs, for example, it's really just always next person up. You're going to try and roster and maybe eventually you'll hit. I added some Clyde Edwards Alaire this week, even though he has a long stretch of performance suggesting that even if he gets out there, he's not going to do much for you, but it's, it's just different. Now I know a lot of people are enthusiastic about the Colts. Maybe this would have been different. If you had to respect Anthony Richardson's rushing ability, you would have liked to think that somewhat respecting Joe Flacco's passing, which might be a, an overstated element Joe Flacco's passing is more good for fantasy than it necessarily is for reality. But Sermon, ineffective on those carries, doesn't evade an a tackle. Tyler Goodson, if you're really desperate, is an interesting player because he's kind of the passing down guy. Now, they go back to Anthony Richardson. It probably matters a lot less. Tyler Goodson, someone who never really jumps to the head of any of those lists because even as a college player, he didn't evade a lot of tackles. And so you're kind of thinking, well, this is a small receiving back who mostly if there's some space, he'll run through it, but he's not going to do anything that's not there. Well, we saw on Sunday that that can actually help sometimes. He had a couple spaces he ran through them. That's not something that Trey Sermon tends to do, and it is valuable. It's something that Joe Mixon did for 102 yards, right? You have a hole, you just run in the hole, right? That's what you want to do in those situations. Colin Jalen Warren didn't do anything but was back. I think that that's a probably a great buy low, even with all of the caveats that we have mentioned about what the Steelers are doing. This is your chance to get Braylon Allen after he's taken completely out of the game. A lot of times, in order to accomplish your objectives, you've got to strike when it doesn't seem like the right time because that's the only time that you can actually make a move. So be aware of some of those types of guys. Think through what your roster needs and how you're going to man manage this week. Because if you're in a 12-week schedule, we're halfway there. If you're in 14-week, we're still, uh, you, you can't afford to give up too many more games. One of the other things that I'm seeing, Colm, I'd be interested to know from you as we close out. So many of my leagues, you have a lot of high scorers, but the records are very compressed. We don't have a ton of teams running away from things. You've got teams that are leading the league where they're two and four or three and three because of some of the inconsistent ways points have been scored because of the units of the season in home leagues. You're going to have a lot of compression as well. 
in many ways, it feels like we're a lot of the way through, but we also have barely started in terms of what actually matters. You have a chance to go out there and win your league from this point on. Yeah, I would uh, agree with exactly how you said it there across the leagues. There's going to be some leagues where teams have, you know, six wins or five and one. But in general, it is very, very compressed. So there's a lot to play for over these remaining weeks. We are going to leave it there. I will link the article in today's show notes. So check out Sean's piece up on rotaviz.com. If you're signing up over at Rotoviz, you can use the code RV Radio 2024 at checkout to get yourself a 10% discount off a Rotoviz NFL pass. My name is Colin Kelly. You can follow me on Twitter at over to Marlin. My co host is Sean Siegel. Check out his work up on rotaviz.com. You can also check out him and Ben on Stadium Bananas. But until we are back, good luck in week seven and have a good one.